All right. This is more like, it. okay. So everybody welcome. Uh, thanks for coming here to uh, our little webinar on emerging settings. Uh, my name is Jason Vion. I am a committee member of the uh, PATS Committee on Practice Advancement. That is what COPA stands for, those of you that did not know that. Um, I'm gonna be helping moderate the, the session today. So PATS COPA focuses on just helping people, helping FLA trainers show value to their services regardless of their settings um, that they work in. Um, and it's through this ability to show value and worth that uh, we can provide and you know, and what our jobs entail and showing that uh, there's, there's worth to that and dollar value to that and savings and those sorts of things. It helps us to create jobs, uh, improve current jobs, um, and also transition to other settings that maybe we didn't easily or didn't think of initially. And, and this session really is about that, about some different settings that maybe you as, an, as a student and, or as a new grad or somebody maybe in transition is not really thinking about. Um, these are some different settings that are outside of those traditional ones we think of, high school, college, professional sports, and have a great value and are, are able to provide a great service athletic trainers in these settings because of the skills that we have. And we're really, really just kind of focusing on some of those, some of those pieces of, of things. The, oops, here we go. As we go through the session, there is a Q&A chat or a q a box in uh, at the probably at the located at the bottom of your screens and please feel free at any point to type in a question to the presenters that are there and we have this structure we should have some wiggle room between um, when a presenter is presenting and some time for questions so we're going to try and tackle it from the aspect of we'll ask try and answer some questions with each presenter but then we also have a q a session kind of like a panel discussion at the end where we should be able to um, answer uh, a bunch of questions that maybe weren't uh, initially answered and, uh, and go from there. So um, we really wanted to present something like this because we understand that look, the COVID-19 situation has really kind of thrown a wrench in the works with a lot of uh, new graduates and current ATs, made it a little bit more stressful to try and figure out where we, where we can land in this whole thing. So we're hoping you can kind of get some ideas uh, with that because these are skills that we have, that we've been developing for a number of years, where there were a new grad, we've been working for a little while. And so we have essentially six uh, presentations here tonight. So ranging every, every, from healthcare administration, military, the um, performing arts, public safety, industrial occupational, athletic trainers in a uh, physician practice. So we'll kind of go through these and again, take some questions as we can, answer some other questions in the uh, Q&A towards the end. So there is also, upon the completion of this program, we're gonna be able to send out a link to everybody that's attended that's gonna have a, a folder of some different brochures that are kind of encapsulating some basic information about each one of these settings too, that we hope you can find useful as a way to kind of remember um, some of the things discussed, but as also a kind of a reminder on some of the potential that's out there. Yeah. Uh, we do, I do want to thank thank some people for helping out with this uh, this webinar. It was kind of brought together a little bit a uh, little bit quickly, and so we thank everybody that's uh, been able to help out there. All right. Now, with that being said, I'm going to stop my PowerPoint here, and I would like to turn this over to uh, Seth Kinley. He is our first presenter. And let me make sure we have him set up. So he received his undergrad degree from Cedarville College in Ohio. He's got his master's degree in, oops, master's degree from Auburn University. And since 2007, he has been working in an administrative role in Susquehanna Health, which is now actually UPMC. And Seth is currently the director of, of uh, musculoskeletal operations for UPMC Susquehanna and Williamsport. So with that, I'm going to let Seth take it away. And let's just make sure that you can set up your screen there, Seth, and then we should be good to go. All right, thanks, Jason, appreciate that. Um, as Jason said, I'm currently the director of musculoskeletal services operations at UPMC Susquehanna here in Williamsport. Um, my role is to oversee 
the operations of our orthopedic sports medicine, foot and ankle, and rheumatology practices here locally, as well as whenever they go to do outreach to other locations uh, that falls under my responsibility. So uh, that's kind of about me. Like Jason said, I've been doing this since 2007. I graduated from Cedarville with my undergraduate way back in 1992. So I've been doing this for a little while, worked as an athletic trainer in the college setting as well as the high school setting, um, did some outreach clinic work, and then also uh, at some at a Division One university. <clears throat> Group born and raised here in Williamsport, so I took the opportunity to come back home here back in 2006, and then in 2007 I started my uh, trail or process to be where I'm at today. So started out as a manager of a small operations here in Williamsport, the, the Sports Medicine Center. Uh, started that back in 2007 and have been asked to promote and put a tie around my neck a few years ago and try to run the ship that we call MSK Services here in Williamsport. So I'll pull up my, I'll start sharing my screen and pull up the PowerPoint and then hit some of the bullets of uh, some of the things that are on the uh, on my PowerPoint here. So bear with me as I try to get this up and running. Can somebody give me a thumbs up that they can see that okay? Looks like I got it okay. So here we go. Uh, job duties. Um, Obviously, depending on the position that you're in, um, that's what your job duties are, are going to fall under. Um, whether you're supervisor, manager, or director, all those uh, responsibilities and roles are defined by those particular titles. Um, obviously, the, the move from supervisor to manager or director is increased responsibilities, a lot of increased number of staff, um, and then you may get to the point where you're overseeing physicians or uh, APPs. The responsible for a lot of times for hiring and dismissing a staff also includes uh, some of the discipline of staff that's needed. Um, and then also that also uh, goes to the physicians as well as the APPs. Um, my role now is I manage and oversee all of our department meetings. Uh, we have a about three big department meetings that we have um, on a regular basis here in our system. Um, and I oversee those and make sure that those runs work with the appropriate leader uh, to develop the agendas and then uh, make sure minutes are done and then appropriate follow through based on the discussions are done. I also uh, recently have been involved in physician as well as PAs, uh, their contracts and the contract language. Obviously that's a little bit something that I have had to learn on the job because that's not something that uh, I was taught along the way. Uh, but having some good support um, and learning that has been valuable to that. I think that's the part in the midst of this is, you know, we as athletic trainers, I think we're good to do a good job of going with the flow and coming up with new and innovative ideas to tackle problems. You know, we're constantly being tasked to deal with one or two or three different sports depending on our location. So, you know, we're very adaptable. And, you know, that was, I think, some of the things that were appealing to people that were above me that they that they saw. So, you know, some of those things that we do a good job of as an athletic trainer certainly translates into some more administrative roles. Um, also, you know, the last couple of points that I have there, I think those are other things that we as athletic trainers have done a great job with. You know, we know depending on where you are and what your environment is, you know, we tend to know that we need to network with security and we need to facilities and um, administration at our schools or, you know, in our work environments. So I think we're well adapted to know that we need to network and we need to work with other people to make sure our jobs go well. And as you know, the traditional athletic training role you know, if you're at a high school, obviously you want to work with your maintenance guys, your facilities guys, you know, so that translates into some of the role that I have where I'm working with maintenance and facilities and security lab 
other hospital departments. Uh, so that doesn't change, it just is a different environment. The other part, you know, it, that uh, everybody wants to know about is, you know, I'm responsible to develop and monitor budgets. Um, the other thing we do is here locally, our providers are measured by their work, which is those RVU units. So it's not specific to the amount of dollars that they generate, but each task that they do has an RVU value to it. So that's how we measure ours, which is something that's that's new and different. Um, had to learn that, but um, that's something that uh, our system uses as a basis for. So you need to learn. I need to learn those things. Then the other thing too, you know, like an athlete trainer, we typically want to know, you know, are the treatments that we're doing, are the things that we're doing, do they have better outcomes? Do they result in our student athletes being healthier and less risk for injury? You know, we, we do the same things where we do quality measures for our departments. How are, how's our outcomes? How are our infections? How's our length of stay? Those are type of things that we monitor. Um, so similar process, just a different environment, uh, so to speak. How do you get to this point in time? Um, you know, I think now, you know, right now I'm um, overseeing a um, fellow, administrative fellow that, that our UPMC uh, has an administrative fellow program. Um, so that's an opportunity that you could consider to do um, as an opportunity to move into healthcare administration if you feel like that's um, something you want to do. If you have the opportunity to shadow an athletic trainer, that would be a great thing. Um, to do, I think, you know, as I've been in this role, I see more and more athletic trainers within our own system that are in administrative roles. You certainly would want to evaluate the potential to get your master's degree, such as an MBA or, you know, the, the Masters of Healthcare Administration. Those are two programs that are pretty popular um, if you look are looking towards an administrative role. Another way to kind of get a feeling for it, you know, you can most nowadays with the technology and the websites, you know, you can go on various institutions and take a look at what their management administrative roles are and what the job descriptions entail. So you have to do a little bit of research to, to do that, but that would at least give you a decent idea of what those job descriptions would and job roles are, how, they, how they're defined. You know, if you have the opportunity to attend any of the things that COPA puts on, such as this or other things, um, that would be not a bad idea to do. You know, there's certain district and local and as well as national committees um, that you could join and, and be a part of as well for this. Management credentials, um, MGMA is the kind of the reference that we use here locally um, to as far as medical practice management. You know, they are the ones that help us define uh, salary and what's productive as far as RVUs go for our providers and they're a good resource to do. They do put on a few conferences here and there um, and you can go on their website and take a look at that. Um, American Association of Healthcare Administration, similar body to MGMA um, and has similar re resources as well as a certification program that you, you can go through. And then the professional organizations, obviously the uh, Emerging Settings Group is, is a good one. Um, and then the other one is uh, AAOE, which is American Association of Orthopedic Executives, um, is another professional organization that is really specific to orthopedics and sports medicine and, and the oversight of that from a management or executive standpoint. So that's kind of a little bit about what I do. It's not all encompassing. Um, obviously I'm here still in my office at 522 and got here a little after seven this morning. So, you know, I think long hours aren't anything that are unfamiliar to an athletic trainer. So it, it doesn't really change necessarily sometimes the work time, even though you're in an administrative role, uh, there's still early morning meetings and evening meetings that uh, are responsible for. So it's not a, it's not always a move to the office means a much more regular schedule. It does allow for a little bit more consistent schedule. Um, but not always the prime schedule that people think that they're going to get when they go to administration. So hopefully this was helpful. I'll be around to answer some questions. Um, 
as we go forward. And Great. Jason, do I know if, if there any questions I can do right now? Uh, none that came in, but I, I have I have one that I can uh, I think would be a, a good one. And again, everybody feel free to throw in some questions. And I know we have only a moment or two before we'll bring Dr. Sefton on. But like Seth, is there um, is there some things that you miss from you know by transitioning to this, and then other things that you don't miss uh, transitioning from you know where you were before to more of a managerial role? Great question. And uh, yeah, it took me <clears throat> in my first role. I was the manager of the sports, just the sports medicine portion of, of uh, here at Susquehanna, and uh, so I still had my hands in it. Uh, but as I've kind of moved from that role into the role I'm in now, I've gotten less and less involved in direct patient care. Um, although I do get called from the proverbial bull bullpen to kind of help out if there's a need for coverage of an event or a school or, you know, just something gets out of whack. So I have done some coverage um, as recently as right before COVID. I was covering a school for a, a little bit of time just because we had change over but yeah I think that was probably if you talk to my wife and friends that was probably the hardest thing for, was for me to move from you know direct patient care because I had done it for so long up until then um, so that that's the part I miss um, the hands-on being able to interact with patients mm -hmm. um, things that I don't miss um, you know I think now I'm afforded the opportunity to take uh, time off whenever I would like to. I don't have to revolve around a sports season or a sports schedule. Obviously, there's busier times and less busier times for us locally. But um, and then Saturdays and Sundays are pretty much uh, I can I can do my thing. So a little bit of gain in the schedule, loss of patient care. I don't know that that exactly balanced out, but uh, those are the hopefully that answers your question. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah great. Thank you very much for thank you for sharing about sharing that. So everybody, um, Seth is going to be able to stay on and uh, for the panel discussion towards the end. So if something occurs to you, feel free again to throw that into the, the Q&A box there. Uh, up next, we have uh, Dr. Joellen Sefton. Uh, Dr. Sefton has been a mass massage therapist for 25 years and an athletic trainer for 19. Uh, as an AT, she's worked with professional sports, performing arts, high school clinics, and the military. Um, she's currently a professor at Auburn University where she's the director of the Warrior Research Center. Uh, her work for the past 13 years is focused on building AT programs in the Army and training ATs to help ensure ATs have a place in the new holistic health and fitness program going Army-wide. So her research focuses on reducing injury and improving rehabilitation and performance for tactical athletes. So a little welcome to Dr. Sefton. And uh, Dr. Sefton, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jason, and thank you, Seth, for inviting me. I know I'm not in Pennsylvania right now, but uh, I've lived all over, so um, I'm a Yankee at heart. Um, but um, I think what everybody is sharing today is really, really important because these, what we call emerging um, places to work, um, we've really been there forever. Um, they start out in the military, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, so not so much emerging, but uh, maybe less known. And I think they have an awful lot to offer, and I've worked in a lot of different places. So um, nobody talked to me about military when I was a student. Um, not at all. I wanted to go a professional sports course, and especially football, because I love football. But um, I have really found my place working with the military. So let me share my screen. Let's hope this all works. And everybody can let me know. We good, Jason? Yep, you're good. Excellent. All right. So. So military athletic training, um, why would you want to do it? What's it all about? Like I said, we've been doing it for a very long time and there's some things that are, are very special about it. Um, why do I love it? Um, 
military athletic trainers, and, and a lot of this refers to people working with tactical athletes too, police, fire, I, I do all those things. Um, they really work as a part of a healthcare team, but you're all focused on really helping those service members. And I know we're all focused on helping our athletes, um, but it feels different in, in this case. The service members, they're very respectful. They're going to treat you as a part of, as a healthcare provider. I, I know many of us have worked in places, not so much anymore, but especially in the past where you were treated as a water boy, a water girl, it's not going to happen here. They listen to you, they trust what you say, and uh, they assume that you know what you're doing, which is just a wonderful experience. And to me, it feels important. And we're all seeing in the COVID environment, sports has gone away for the most part, and uh, the rest of the world is still here. So as much as I love sports, my tactical athletes are still working. They're still putting themselves out there. They're putting their lives at risk, and they're doing it usually for little pay, and they're volunteering. Um, so it feels important to me to keep them alive. And sometimes when you get them healed, you get them back to full performance. That's exactly what you're doing. You're keeping them alive. Um, you're helping them have a better career when you get hurt in the military. If you can't perform physically, it significantly hurts your career. Or you're helping them get started better on, on their career. Um, research has shown um, when you perform better physically in the beginning of your career, you tend to stay in longer, you advance more, you have more seniority. So you can really make a difference. That feels more important to me than getting somebody out to a game. I, don't get me wrong, I loved working with all different sports I've worked with. Um, somehow this feels different. Now, all AT is challenging. Um, military takes that whole, to a whole new level. You're going to see things you've never seen before, trust me. And um, depending on the population, you're going to wonder how they did that. I never heard of more neck stress fractures till I started working with the military. I had 85 in one place in one year. There are things that um, you're not used to dealing with, um, but you will. And for the most part, if um, weather's not good or whatever, you can move practice, you can't move training, you can't move missions. They do it no matter what, and that's challenging. Um, so also, depending on where you're working, things are gonna be different, but you could, like Seth mentioned, have more of a life. Um, populations differ, so that's something to keep in mind when I'm talking about all these things. Populations will differ a little bit. If you're working with special forces, if you're working with one of the military academies, it could be very much like working with collegiate sports. You have seasons and you have trips and travel. But if you're working with an initial entry training, think of that as boot camp, that type of work. Um, you're not going to have weekends for them sometimes, but you're not going to have trips. Um, you will get up very early. I spent eight years getting up at 1.30 to 2 o'clock in the morning, um, but um, that had to do with time zone changes and hour drives. Um, you will get up early, but then you tend to end early as well. So in that way, if you're interested in having a family life, this could be the way to go for you. So what do we do? We do the same things other athletic trainers do. We do them a little differently in a little different places. You kind of spend a lot of time in value muscular skeletal injuries. Concussions, heat injuries. I'm down in the South. I'm in Alabama and Georgia. Um, we get heat injuries in February sometimes. So yes, keep in mind that when we train, we train in full gear, full kit as we're talking about. So you don't get to wear shorts and not your helmet on the range if that's what you're scheduled to do. Now, the military is very cognizant, especially with the deaths that we've had in past of changing uniform requirements. Um, if you're on a mission in Afghanistan, you're gonna wear your protective gear because you know, passing out because of heat is better than getting shot. Um, you're gonna spend time looking at trends and patterns Depending again on who you work with, special forces versus initial entry training, you may spend a lot of time assessing things like fitness level, safety hazards, again, heat. Um, 
The next two really go together, development and implementation of programs in education. I kind of see those all together. I separated them out here so we could think of them differently. You may develop or implement or continue um, musculoskeletal injury prevention and tracking programs. Uh, here, prevention is a huge thing. Musculoskeletal injury is the number one problem in the military. It affects force readiness, so they really care about it. And in the last eight years, they've really got on board with training changes and um, healthcare changes and things like that. You're gonna spend a lot of time coordinating with other providers, just like you might in another profession or working in another place. You may be working with providers who don't have a clue what athletic trainers are, don't like that you're there, that's changing, but um, depending on where you work, they may think that they should be doing your work. Um, you're gonna be doing a lot of rehabilitation and return to duty programs. That's, you're gonna do anywhere. Again, if you're working in initial entry training, you may do fitness improvement programs, heat mitigation programs. Now, I say where you work matters. If you're working with special forces, they have full teams. They're going to have a sports psychologist, a nutritionist. They're going to have a CSCS, an athletic trainer, um, maybe an exercise physiologist. So you would only do injury treatment and work with the team to prevent injuries. If you're in initial injury training, you may have to do all those things. You may have to be the expert on those things. Um, so take, you'll, you'll take advantage of the teams that you have. Again, everybody's goal is to help improve the wellness and keep that service member safe. We also do a lot of education and I've spent a lot of time developing education programs, running programs. If, if you run properly, you may have fewer overuse injuries, lifting form spent a lot of time communicating with command, my command structure and the cadre, how many entries were we having? Have those changed? Do those change between location? Um, is one unit having a whole lot of musculoskeletal injuries and another one isn't? If so, why? Um, you can become a detective. I had one place where one unit had almost a 40% injury rate and another unit under the same command had 10%. We watched training, we did all these things. We actually came down to the fact it was simply the location of the unit away from command and the DFAC, which is the dining hall. They actually ended up walking five or six extra miles a day. So we were able to adjust that and what they were doing and injuries dropped. So that's a really fun thing um, to do. And we also spend a lot of time, depending on where you are, informing everybody of our scope of practice and what we can do. Because in a lot of places, Army is different from Navy, different from Air Force, different from the Marines, but in some cases, we're not allowed yet to work to our full scope of practice. And a number of those, COPA and other groups, have been working to change that, and we're finally having some success with that. Now, um, how do you prepare for that? Um, Jason mentioned we're about to have a bunch of athletic training jobs in the Army open up. There's the H2F, Holistic Health and Fitness Program opening. We're working on the doctrine now. We were able to get athletic trainers in the doctrine, which is so important with the Army. If it's in the doctrine, people have to do it. If it's not, and they think it's just a good idea, then the next command that comes along can change. Um, it's in the doctrine, we're on page one, we're in the opening figure. I'm lucky enough to have the command people working on this, having worked with us before, so they listen to what we say. So these jobs are opening up, will they be easy to get? They're going to need a lot of them, but the requirements are high. Something else that may be different from what you're used to. Most jobs are with contracting organizations. I see this sometimes in high schools, not so much with universities. They're, most of them are not government jobs. If you see a GS position, open up, grab it, and hold on to it. Those are secure, generally well-paid government jobs with great benefits. 
the contracting organizations, what happens is somebody will win a contract with DOD to supply athletic trainers. They may be supplying um, food service in their other contracts and not know anything about what athletic trainers do. There are a few that have been with us now and doing this for five or six years, the ones that took over our contracts. Um, hopefully those, those situations are getting better. Some are better than others. Uh, I know a lot of ATs that um, I'm connected with will move basic based on who the contract is with. So they may move from one post to another post uh, because the contractor is better and they get better services. So checking in when you do see jobs posted, how long are they for? Are they just a year contract? Are you going to move across the country for one year and not have a job guaranteed? Um, is it a two or three year contract? Is it a three year position, but their contract ends in a year? So you could have a three year position guaranteed, but the contracting organization's contract runs out in a year. If they lose that contract, you lose that job. A lot of times they'll hire you back, but it's hassle and it's stressful and they're just things to be aware of that's different here. Requirements are usually a minimum of five years experience, sometimes more. So these are generally not entry level jobs. A master's military experience and able to be licensed and pass a security check. Um, so if you have felonies or anything else, of course, that's a problem. If you have a DWI, something like that, or DUI, um, that can be a problem too. Now, people ask me, it requires military service or experience. How do you get that if all military positions require military experience? That can be hard. And there are no longer any graduate programs that have experience in the military. I think ours was the last one. The things that you can do, our university and a number of others, and this is increasing, offer GA positions with ROTC units. That really helps. You might be able to find something with police or fire. That would really help. I don't like that many athletic trainers, a lot of times we feel like we need other certifications to be good enough to get jobs. So I hate to say get a CSCS. But in this case, it will make a huge difference. They're also hiring those positions. Um, CSCS is sometimes better known in the military than athletic trainers. If you have that dual credential, it will make you much more successful in your job search. Um, but the other thing to remember, they're not entry level jobs. Keep looking, keep learning. If you can get uh, experience with police and fire, that'll make a big difference. But as these open up, I think some of these experience requirements will change. And they do listen to reason or influence. I had a student graduate with me. Um, he only had two years experience. No, and he worked with ROTC, so we had that. But he was a prior Marine. So they assumed he knew what the military was about. I talked to a few people, we made some calls, and he was able to get that job. So there are some things that you can do. Um, so I think that's all I have. I cannot stay for the final panel. I have another commitment. So if anybody has any jobs I made sh or questions, sorry, uh, I made sure I saved enough time. So I'm happy to ask next, excuse me, now. Um, or if you think of something after this, after you know, the presentations, if you just email them in, um, I'm sure Jason or whoever will get those yeah. to me. Yeah, we can absolutely do that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sefton. I appreciate the, the information. We did have two questions come in that you may have kind of touched on already. Mm -hmm. um, so first one is, uh, as a U.S. Army veteran wanting to give back, how would one start the process or enter the military as an AT or as, or as a civilian contractor? Rather? Your military experience will help you. Um, they love people who speak their language. Um, I'm told all the time, oh, you speak Army, okay. Um, as you know then as a military veteran, um, and we thank you for your service, that um, you already understand the command structure and all those kind of things. So that will help you. 
they struggle to waive that experience. And it's a lot of times you're out there on your own. You may be in the field on your own. They really want to know that you can handle that emergency. So four or five years working football or combat sport, uh, sport especially, or contact, sorry. I'm, more, I'm used to saying combat. Um, will help you so they can see that you've got that experience, especially when other people are around in case you need a hand. Uh, that's really what that experience is about. So getting those skills and that experience is great. And then just keep watching for these jobs. Uh, Jason, one thing I forgot to mention, when you do your CSCS, um, National Strength and Conditioning Organization has a tactical athlete specialty um, the person who runs that, Nate, is great. I work with him a lot. He is the next Army Ranger. And um, those skills, that additional certification is really powerful and um, another thing that you can do. Great. Um, something else that has come in too. So uh, do you eventually see a shift of uh, hybrid positions? So admin, clinical within the military to begin working on long-term management of military healthcare? Yeah, so um, several people that I started as GAs, I was able, so um, I did a lot of time building the programs. I also covered units when I had to. Um, people I started as graduate assistants, I ended up hiring full-time. I had 33 people in at Fort Benning, um, at our largest, I then brought them in as clinical coordinators and clinical supervisors. They've gone on to take uh, other supervisory positions in the military. So um, once you get into that system, there are all kinds of avenues. If you do well and your unit likes you, they will help you. Great. Um, I got, I have, I have one more here. And then again, if you have more questions, everybody, if you throw them in there and we can always uh, email them and then get some answers for you. I, I apologize. Our, our time's a little limited, but, um, do you do extensive, uh, PPEs for new people to prevent potentially few, put, um, basically prevent future industry in, injur yeah, injuries like foot position or foot posture index, joint angles, different things like that? Say that again to me, I wasn't following. That's okay. I was also stumbling through that question. <laughs> Sorry about <laughs> When you say PPE, I'm thinking personal protection right oh, now. Oh, yeah, so. yeah. Um, I'm assuming pre-participation examination. Thank you. My brain has a hard time shifting from COVID. We, um, they didn't used to. Um, they're getting better. We started a program where we screen 60,000 soldiers a year, every soldier coming in to train at Fort Benning um, to test for fitness level and to pull them into another program that they had um, if their fitness was so low. When, and I, it's funny, I just had a call with the Marines this week. They're having the same kind of problem. When you think of military, you think of high performing athletes, but they don't come in that way. They represent um, our nation as a whole. We know how unfit our nation is. These are the people that volunteer. Um, so there is a lot to be gained at their fitness level. Um, they've changed training a lot, but we do a lot of trying to screen them, figure out who's gonna get hurt and try to fix that. But time is limited. And once you come in, you only have a certain amount of time to finish. So we really fight that battle all the time. That's a great question. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, and Dr. Sethan. Thank you so much for the time. I, uh, I we really appreciate you you being here. And um, if the questions are any indication, there's uh, some some enthusiasm out there for this for this particular setting. Excellent. Thanks for having me. I always love talking to students. So good luck, everybody. Worry. Be safe. War Eagle, Seth. <laughs> awesome. Very good. So next up, next up we have uh, Stephanie Walsh. Stephanie uh, obtained her Bachelor's of Science in Athletic Training at Westchester University, so a homegrown one here, and uh, Master's of Science in uh, Kinesiology with an emphasis in athletic training at Georgia Southern. University. She created and implemented an athletic training position at a local fire and police department in South Georgia. And she's uh, going to tell us about the public safety setting and some of her experiences there. So take it away, Stephanie.
Hello, everyone. So before I begin, um, this is pretty much very similar to Dr. Septon. Um, again, we're working with tactical athletes here. So a lot of it's going to be pretty similar. Um, but I did want to add Georgia Southern University does have a GA ship um, with Fort Stewart. So there still is. Um, right now, there's only one position and it is up for grabs right now, um, which unfortunately, you know, if you applied to grad school, um, you'd have to wait another two years to have access to that. But that is an option and something to keep in mind that there is one school that still has the opportunity to be a graduate assistantship, um, and that's with Fort Stewart. So I just wanted to include that opportunity in there before you get started. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the public safety setting, um, essentially, which is fire and police and my experiences. So how do athletic trainers fit in the public uh, safety setting? So as a master's student at Georgia Southern University, my passion has always been working with tactical athletes. Again, there's something special about serving those who serve us. Um, you just have this, this deeper connection to these people and you able it's it's a job that you get a lot back from um, so at my time at Georgia Southern we have connections with our university at a local fire and police department um, that strength and conditioning was um, some of their graduate assistants were in there and started kind of just general fitness testing and assessing and working to improve the general wellness and I had sat in on a presentation and after had talked to someone and said, hey, I'm an athletic trainer. I discussed the five domains and everything that we're able to do for these populations. Um, and then I introduced myself to the chief of police, chief of fire, um, again, advocated for athletic training in this population. That's huge. A lot of times people don't understand exactly what athletic trainers are. They think sometimes that we're just people who help others get in shape um, and don't really understand all the benefits that we can provide and especially in the fire and police, reducing workman's comp and increasing safety is huge. Um, so kind of selling yourself, and that's how I got into the setting and created an athletic training position with our local fire and police. So just some background information. There's tons of injuries that happen in the fire department, and within the last 10 years, we've reduced quite a few, um, and this is due to the National Fire Protection increasing their training standards, um, and also incorporating athletic trainers and general wellness and individuals who are able to help with wellness has aided in reducing these injuries, but we still have a long way to go. Um, the leading injuries are strain sprains, slips, trips, and falls, decreased mobility and flexibility because they're wearing all of this gear. All things that us as athletic trainers are overqualified and can do a great job at reducing these risks of injuries. Again, law enforcement officers or LEOs have high rates of injuries uh, due to running, carrying their gear. Um, they wear vests that sometimes weigh up to 60 pounds with all of their flashlights and ammunition on them. And then they're sitting in a vehicle that's altering their posture. Um, so again, athletic trainers play a crucial role in just teaching proper uh, first screening and then teaching proper ways of how we can maybe shift these loads or properly train these individuals um, that they're better prepared for their job duties. So a big part about what I did was um, with our fire and police, we did pre-participation screen. So every year, everyone got a physical checkup and then we worked with our exercise science lab at Georgia Southern to um, basically test all of their fitness levels, their strength, their endurance, um, there, we, were, we did a lot of functional movement screens and postural assessments. So essentially, we want to see how they're moving. Are they moving exceptionally, which most of them are not. Most of them are scoring very low and they have reduced mobility. Then you put their gear on that sometimes for firefighters weighs up to 90 pounds and they again have even more reduced mobility. So having these screens uh, to begin was a huge aspect of what I did. Um, and then from there, we were able to give corrective exercises or figure out how we can narrow down our scope of practice and help those um, and kind of figure out where to go from there. Also, you have a lot of administrative people um, or police that sit at their desk all day filling out paperwork. 
Um, so ergonomic assessments were a big part of what I did as well. Basically just making small adjustments when you can and helping um, to improve their posture and their workspace so that they're able to efficiently work and have reduced injuries. The needs analysis in the tactical population is huge. Um, a lot of times, like Dr. Sefton was saying, you're working as a team. So you may be working with, depending upon your departments, how big they are, how many resources you have in the area, what are the connections that you have. Obviously, you're going to be working under a physician, have your standing orders, um, but you're going to evaluate and then you're going to analyze what you need to do, design a specific program. So it's no different than having sports specific skills. Um, you need to understand what these firefighters and police are doing, how heavy of gear are they holding, what are the movements and motions that they're doing to jump over a fence or climb their ladder, um, and design a specific program with exercises that mimic those um, tasks and develop something that works for them. So something that's unique to the tactical population is um, in the strength and conditioning world, which is again, very helpful, you have these periods and, and plans that, you know, you, you know, you have preseason for maybe a few weeks and then you have your whole season and then you have your conference at the end and your playoffs. With the tactical population, there's not always um, a specific goal like that. Sometimes you can say, okay, we have to train four weeks in order for you to take your test um, and see if you're able to get into the academy or anything like that. But for the most part, there's no competition day for them. They have to be on top of their game at all times and they're risking their lives at all times. They might get a call and they have to jump up and their adrenaline's rushing and they don't know what they're responding to. Um, so developing a program sometimes can be difficult, um, but that's just something to keep in mind. And then making sure that you're implementing it in a way that works. They work shifts and long hours and sometimes getting them in for rehabilitation or for training or corrective exercises can be difficult because you might say at 8 a.m. every day, we're gonna have our rehab, um, but they're at an emergency call from 8 a.m. until 2 p.m. Um, so making sure that you're having a flexible schedule but implementing it in a way that it's able to work with these departments. Um, another huge aspect of working with tactical athletes is increasing their mobility and flexibility. This is where you can have a lot of fun. There's a lot of different ways to do stretching, myofascial release, uh, foam rolling, cupping, massage has really become big in a lot of years. And with the tactical population, it's really important with any of the emergent settings to build rapport. You're coming um, as an outsider and in the fire and police, especially they're a brotherhood, they're a very tight knit family. Um, and you have to show them that you're there to help them. Um, and this, when you hold small mobility and flexibility clinics, this is a fun time to get to know your men and women that you're working with and, and figure out you know, their needs, but also have fun with it, see what they can do. Um, and then obviously everyone loves being massaged and cupped. So that's kind of a nice way to grab them in and, and see that they're getting benefits from you. Um, but then also they'll always come back just like all athletes. A lot of times we have in the tactical population, a lot of older gentlemen and females that may have had injuries that they sustained in their twenties and now they're 45 and they're just deciding to get shoulder surgery. Um, so prehab is very important, um, obviously for functional, but there's a lot of different ways of training. So um, these are high stress jobs. Like I said, their sleep schedule is usually off. They're dealing with sometimes um, they're put in positions that, are tough and they may lose patients or individuals. They may show up to an accident that did not turn out too well. Um, so stress management is a big, a big thing and understanding um, that's important to stress their work-life balance. And then obviously nutrition. So this is kind of more prehab, um, kind of has a bigger umbrella with tactical athletes. There's a lot more to think about of what may be going on in their life and preparing them for moving forward. Um, so obviously our training goals, this is kind of where we sell our admin on why they should have an athletic trainer come in and what you can do to serve their departments. 
um, and their people. So obviously you're gonna reduce the risk of injury in workman's comp, um, but you're going to reduce the risk of heat related stress. Um, again, they train and work in environments of, it might be 120 degrees out or they're in a fire um, or maybe it's negative 10 and they have to stand watch for something. Um, so preparing them for the weather and the environment. Um, also fitness testing, agility, uh, safety hazards, things like that are all ways that athletic trainers are able to ensure that they're prepared for these conditions. Also chronic diseases are a very large part of the tactical population. Um, as Dr. Sefton said, these individuals represent America as a whole, um, which a lot of people unfortunately have high cholesterol, diabetes and things like that. So us as athletic trainers are able to provide um, exercises and general wellness that can sometimes assist and reduce these. Load, load carriage training is a big part of what I also did. Um, like I said, they're wearing lots of gear with um, large amounts of weight and sometimes they're not prepared to carry 90 pounds of gear for three hours. Now, eventually over time they adapt, but as athletic trainers, we are able to incorporate in their training, putting a 20 pound weighted vest on once a week um, and being creative and thinking outside of the box is probably the best part about creating programs and rehabilitation programs with tactical athletes as you get to be creative um, and kind of have fun with this. Um, another huge part about what I did was wellness sessions. So weekly and monthly, we would hold um, a different topic and give out free samples, uh, hold certain clinics. We did every Friday a um, exercise and mobility. Well, every Friday was an exercise clinic. It was family fun. Um, their wives or husbands could come and join them if they wanted. And it was just an hour workout session. On Thursday, we did mobility clinics. Um, we also did, like I said, our screenings for their general health. Um, but topics such as sleep, nutrition, exercise, hydration, chronic illnesses, and things we can do to reduce them. Um, but like I said, it's really important to work as a team with this tactical athlete to um, make sure that you have resources readily available. They do deal with a lot of um, mental health issues as well because they are dealing with a lot. So having a psychologist or someone to talk to and understanding our scope of practice, even with nutrition, what we're able to handle and then having the appropriate resources to refer when needed. So my recommendations for working in the public safety setting is be familiar with the NFPA guidelines and also the police training guidelines. Um, this is a huge organization for fire and police that basically set predetermined guidelines of you have to do 100 push-ups to pass in order to be a firefighter or police, um, all different regulations. This is something to be very familiar with so you understand um, what they're up for. And then also the National Institute of Occupational Health is a very um, resourceful information to just read and determine if this is something you are interested in um, or what, how to better prepare if you are going into this setting. My recommendations for networking. Again, if you are at a universal, university or have any local connections, um, this is huge as they're already established. Um, introduce yourself to everyone and anyone. Advocate for athletic training. And if you don't have them, go into your local fire police station, understand um, their system and their dynamic. Are they volunteered? Are they paid? It is a small company that only has 45 employees or is it a huge company that has 400 employees? Um, introduce yourself and again, advocate for athletic training. What can you do to serve them? Um, how much money can you save for them? What are some great safety opportunities that you can provide? Uh, recommended credentials. The Tactical Strength and Conditioning is a certification, the TSAC. Here's the book. It is a fantastic resource. This book talks about military, fire, and police personnel. Um, it is strength and conditioning based, um, and it has all kinds of things about nutrition, but it is an excellent resource. Um, the book was fairly cheap, and it has uh, tons of exams that you can take, um, similar to the BOC, to be prepared um, and ready to take that. Also, the CSCS is great. A lot of times in this role, they won't have, these local departments won't have strength and conditioning and you will have to be a person creating programs. So having that background knowledge um, would help you excel and make your job a little bit easier. And then also being certified in FMS. 
for us, the functional movement screening was huge. This was this is a way to determine our problem areas and then to subscribe corrective exercises. And then that is all I have for you today. If anybody has questions, put them in the chat or you could again email us. Very good, Stephanie. That was great. Thank you. Um, I do have I do have one one question and then we'll we'll kind of move on to our next speaker. But where um where did the interest come in? with the setting with uh with public safety so for me like i said i i think there's a deeper meaning to serving those who serve others and for this population um it's always interesting because you have to be so creative and think out of the box um i know i had a lot of people who firefighters specifically they work multiple jobs um and for me it was really hard to have people come in and work you know, do their rehab or anything like that. Um, so sometimes I'd have to say, okay, go fill up your, your bucket that you're doing in your construction site with dirt and do your bicep curls with that. Um, so I wanted something that was out of side of the box, challenged me a little bit, but that I was able to help others in the community. Um, and for this, this was an awesome experience and opportunity and I highly recommend it for anyone. Very good, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right, folks. So we're going to move on to uh, Kelly Unru. <clears throat> so Kelly's our current uh, Pat's Copa chair, chair, chair person, and uh, she graduated from University of New Hampshire, starting out in clinical outreach, followed by phys physician practice, with where she had a 60-40 split of her time, and with part of that time as an apprentice under an orthotist. Um, then she was a uh, adjunct professor, followed by a traditional athletic trainer, prior to entering occupational industrial setting, where she currently works for uh, CIP, CIP Solutions as a vice president and a senior injury prevention specialist. So Kelly, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Jason. Let me see if I get this to play. All right, are we all good with that? Uh, I can see you. Are you sharing sharing a PowerPoint or anything? Just mm, see that. Let me try one more time. There we go. Better? Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> Tricky, too many buttons, you know? All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks for uh, having me. And thanks for everybody for uh, helping and put this together. This has been interesting. I'm loving it, sitting here, listening to other speakers. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, the uh, occupational athletic trainer. And um, let me take my buttons to work here. There you go. Just a little bit of background. Jason kind of gave you like the overview, um, but I kind of wanted to fill you in on where my occupational uh, athletic training started. Um, so I volunteered at, at a sports medicine clinic um, in the 80s, I'm going to date myself a little here, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And at the time, occupational athletic training was basically a room divided into four or five sections where they placed piles of stone, sand, lumber, and those employees would uh, simulate their return to work by lifting, carrying, pushing, pulling material around the facility. So it's, uh, that was kind of the beginning of the, the, return to, the return to work program that we know today. Um, over the years, the simulation evolved into the uh, participation in the FCEs, functional capacity evaluations and work capacity evaluations. And then eventually today, we've taken all that um, in clinic uh, observations and um, return to work process. And now we're actually out in the field with those employees, um, watching them do their work real time. So it's been really exciting to see the change from the, from the beginning to now. Um, so as Jason mentioned, I did transition through a lot of emerg emerging settings. Uh, I was trying to find like, I absolutely loved every single one of them, um, learned a lot, but I think my ultimate niche was occupational. I found that it was the most rewarding and also the most challenging. So I can agree with uh, Stephanie there that challenging uh, is definitely, um, I enjoy that the most. So being creative, working outside the box. All right, to give you an idea of what a typical day looks like, um, so we usually run a day that starts at 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. It's rain, shine, heat, or cold. Um, our work attire is basically jeans, work boots, fire-resistant clothing, 
a hard hat and gloves. So, and, um, and safety glasses. So I have a couple of pictures here of some of the, the views for the day. So you could be in an aerial lift, a um, couple stories by the ground, or you could be actually, you know, helping educate on uh, proper digging or ergonomics. So um, things have changed a little bit with COVID. So we have a little variation here. We are allowed to uh, continue working during COVID because our, uh, the um, work groups that we work with are considered essential employees and um, we are an extension of them since they are essential. So we had to modify our typical work day by instead of going to the facilities and, and following the crews out for the afternoons, um, we actually started calling in, doing a lot of our education via Skype um, or other um, video outlet and providing them our morning messaging there. We uh, report directly to the job sites now. Um, and while there, we're gonna, you know, we engage in all those additional things that we all, you know, are very familiar with now, the social uh, distancing, uh, making sure that we are um, utilizing um, all those tools. And we have to, there's a little caveat for us, everything that we're wearing is, has to be fire resistant. So we have to make sure that even those masks that we're applying um, meet that criteria. So when we're at the job sites, we're engaging in health and wellness consultations with the clients, um, anything that they kind of uh, want to discuss or concerns that they may have, which is nice because again, we're taking some stress away from the healthcare system, especially during this time. Um, we are then uh, compiling data at the end of the day. So from all of our discussions, observations, you know, we're going to head home to our offices. We are mobile, we do work mobily. So you get to, you know, work remotely from wherever you're you're based and we're going to start engaging in some of the documentations um, and then the other projects that that they may be working on and that could be anything from communication projects to physical demands analysis identifying injury prevention te tools techniques and providing some education um, via social media um, also we're going to be utilizing uh, the telehealth services we started sending our employees to a telehealth portal that we had created in order to provide work station assessments um, virtually since we are limited with the um, with social distancing and some of the gathering restrictions. So that's a typical day. We have some variations um, when there's a school that's running a new school then the new hires go through an extensive kind of boot camp similar to your preseason traditional setting. So there are some variations in the day. Um, some of the other benefits to this and uh, I asked a lot of our employees, you know, what were your favorite, what are your favorite things that you would say that you um, like about this setting? And most of them said it's great for work-life balance. Um, if, if you have a family, you have uh, daytime hours, weekends are free. You do have some ability to travel if you choose to. Um, one of the biggest um, travel events for our group is the Lyman's Rodeo out of Kansas City. So there's a bit, usually a bid and fight a little internal war over that one. Um, and then also this the starting salary is starts a little higher than the average uh, traditional setting. So some of the essential job functions, um, this is kind of important when we're looking at transition, transition, transitioning, sorry, from the traditional setting to the occupational setting is what are the jobs that you're, what are the tasks that we're gonna be um, working on? So the goal is just to understand the task at hand and provide prevention techniques whether it be by addressing the worker behavior, providing an administrative control or an engineering control. And we do that through these essential job functions. So worker behavior, no matter what other controls are put in place, are the biggest challenges. You can provide every tool in the book, but they can find out how to use it incorrectly anytime, anywhere. So changing behavior, I'd have to say, is one of the biggest challenges working in the occupational or industrial setting. We utilize, um, we work with the supervisors directly to help uh, implement some of the uh, administrative controls. That's just things like recommending, you know, two people to perform, uh, to work together at a, at a job site. So you're, you're helping prevent the injuries, again, by decreasing the amount of load, velocity, and frequency by increasing the number of employees on one, at one location. So we take those things into consideration when we're analyzing um, those job tasks. As far as working with other healthcare professionals or other groups, um, we do overlap with multiple groups uh, within the client. So again, prevention is, is the key and it requires a lot of teams acting together in order to, to um, send that, that industrial athlete home the same way he came in, hopefully, 
um, healthy. So as a healthcare professional working with those multiple teams, it's essential to achieve injury prevention by overlapping, overlaying, and providing support to the multiple work groups that we um, see within an organization. So as you can see, all these work groups, if they work together, we can send that individual home uh, safely and without injury. So to give you an idea as to the types of settings, um, the, sorry, the work groups that we're seeing here. So if you wanna compare these to your traditional setting, safety and wellness is similar to working with your school nurse, team physician, the kind of like the internal um, health and wellness groups at, those, at your facilities. Then we have the uh, methods and training group, which is gonna be similar to your uh, coaches and equipment managers that they have a say as far as you know, what type of equipment you're gonna be wearing or utilizing um, um, throughout the workday. And then we also have our field operations group, which is gonna be more of your athletic director and administrative staffs. So they have the, they're gonna handle the direct reporting um, and they're gonna uh, have the immediate oversight of the, your work group. And then we have the ones that are more offsite, which is gonna be our occupational health and uh, human resource departments. And those are gonna be like more of your referrals to the outside clinics, um, things along those lines. But no matter what the work group is, everyone is, is working together in order to send those out, um, industrial athletes home without injury. All right, so the other uh, thing that we're gonna see and, and engage in, um, when we are trying to show the upper management where we fall um, into their bottom line, we're gonna have to address uh, data analytics. So basically showing injury prevention is achievable by, by uh, providing a comprehensive prevention program inclusive of health, wellness, and ergonomics. But can you prove it? Um, where is the data? Um, show me on paper how you're improving our bottom line or decreasing those injuries. So the, as the injury rates, uh, if they're increasing, we have to uh, find a mitigation solution and, find, and, and explain why. And then what are we gonna put in place in order to decrease those, um, those injury rates? The, one, the biggest thing that uh, is the hardest to justify is gonna be what's called indirect costs. And indirect costs are gonna be those things that are not part of the spreadsheet. It's all the extras um, that basically run and maintain your company. So that's the hardest sell is that going to be your indirect costs. Preventing future loss is key to changing employee behavior. So how can you do that? Um, what skills are important in your education that set you apart from the rest? So utilizing those tools that we began this conversation with, um, how, how does that apply to your actual, your education? So in my role, I found that the most, um, the most, difficult time um, ATs had during the transition was taking their skill set and applying it to job functions. So we all know how to prevent injuries. We all have a great background in health, wellness, and fitness. Now it's applying those to the job functions, which is going to be thinking outside the box. So occupational athlete trainers have to focus on prevention because we want to cut down those risks of injury and we want to improve their overall health and wellness to keep them working uh, through their, their, their careers. So let me say that again, preventing is the uh, injury, is the, um, is the most important thing that we can do as an occupational athlete trainer to decrease both direct and indirect costs. Now I'm gonna flip through these. You, I'm, gonna, um, I'm not gonna cover every single one, but basically we, what I was able to do is I took the BOC competencies, they're all not inclusive. And uh, I have observed that a successful occupational athlete trainer um, possesses a skill set that allows them to be able to apply these competencies. So if, you, if you're just breaking these down into the three, which is going to be your cognitive, and we're looking at the um, psychomotor, which is going to be similar, again, to what you're doing in a traditional setting, but we're changing the capacity and um, focusing more towards a uh, job function. Uh, also, uh, instructing employees in OSHA uh, guidelines, safe lifting techniques, and, and um, some other patient care items. And then our PPE that we're fitting is going to be a lot different than, uh, than the traditional um, athletic equipment. Uh, another competency is uh, going to be uh, public speaking. We do a lot of public speaking, whether it's through education, it's through one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, our biggest uh, goal is to persuade the listeners to change their behavior. 
Um, we have to make it relatable no matter what message we're sending. And that has to be for those the diverse populations from anywhere from 18 to 65, 70 years old, men, women, and then also be able to communicate to those upper management um, VPs, um, presidents, CEOs, CFOs, uh, and get the same point across in a way that they understand how it's gonna help out um, their employees, but also not create a, uh, a cost draw. As far as um, additional credentialing, my suggestion that, um, that would be postgraduate uh, coursework doesn't mean we have to have a, a, a master's degree. What we're finding is as far as credentialing goes, just make sure that whatever courses you choose, they're gonna consist of some business courses so you can sharpen your skills in the data analytics um, and also in developing those reports for those upper management, um, monthly, weekly, bi-weekly reports that you may have to um, send that, that uh, those personnel. Also focusing on biomechanics, ergonomics, health, wellness, fitness, and co workers' compensation, as well as safety. So some examples would be the credentials I've listed there. You can actually obtain those credentials at a multi multiple um, different uh, organizations. We see them on Back School of Atlanta is one that's, that a lot of uh, individuals utilize or first prevention or prevention first, excuse me. Okay, so as far as um, uh, applying the, your skill set and the knowledge and how do I get my foot in the door, I would have to say, say the biggest thing you can do is gain experience and you can do that through networking and seek out those job shadow opportunities. Um, communicating with individuals that are already working in the setting is going to put you one, one step ahead of those individuals just starting out. We do uh, encourage you to have some kind of work experience transitioning from traditional to um, the industrial or occupational setting. We found that the individual are a little bit more successful in the beginning. It, there's less of a, um, a challenge transitioning from the mindset from traditional to uh, industrial when looking at the job functions, like I mentioned earlier. Well, thank you for uh, having me speak. And um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them either, you know, in the uh, in the Q and A or at the uh, at the end of the uh, conversation, the presentation today during the panel discussion. Good stuff, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's very very interesting. Um, no no Q and As from the uh, from the chat right now. I will throw one one thing at you. Uh, just. OSHA seems to be a big thing in the industrial occupational world. Is there somebody just trying to understand the basics? Where would they, where would they go for that basic info? Um, you could just uh, use OSHA.gov and I would say to kind of get started, familiarize yourself with the, um, um, their, what's considered first aid by OSHA. That's probably a challenge. Uh, we have a lot of things that we consider first aid, but it's not considered this first aid by OSHA. So just making sure that you don't cross those lines and end up creating um, um, issues with the clients as far as uh, OSHA recordability by, you know, kind of stepping over the over those lines. Um, and then also like, addressing your state guidelines, regulations, so that again, you're staying within your practice act while uh, working with this work group, since they are not um, they may not be inclusive of the physically active unless the physician chooses to deem them physically active. Gotcha. At least in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Awesome. And we'll catch you at the, uh, the panel here. So with that being said, we're going to move on to Shannon Mystery. The, um, I apologize, Shannon, if I just mangled your last name. I was, uh, it took, took long enough to pronounce Bonini right. So, <laughs> Uh, Shan's a 2008 graduate of Westchester University, bachelor's in sports medicine, a 2010 graduate of Sacred Heart University in Fairfield, Connecticut, master's in education. And while she was at Sacred Heart working mainly division one ba women's basketball, she was also a professor in the undergrad uh, AT program. She moved back home in 2014, started a position at Premier Orthopedics in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, and in 2016, obtained her orthopedic technician certification to first assist in the OR. So take it away, Shannon. Great. 
Uh, thank you, Jason. So, yep, I was a mid-major Division I athletic trainer for six years, and I was up in Fairfield, Connecticut, and wanted to come back home. I was born in Delaware County, Pennsylvania. I'm a Delco girl. I uh, went to Westchester University, and I was ready to come back home. I um, family was here and everything like that. So a friend of mine was working in a physician's office and she said, why don't I get you this job here and we'll see how it goes. My original plan was to work, network, get back into the college setting because I do love college athletics. Game day is my favorite day, but I've been at this practice for six years. And I think during this, um, you'll probably hopefully learn why I'm still where I am and why I'm, I'm loving what I'm doing. It is different than the traditional setting, but there, there's some similarities that I will go through. As far as this setting is concerned, it is a very much emergent setting still, even though I've been here for six years doing this job, it's developed and changed over time. Eight years ago was when my physicians first started having athletic trainers. Um, back then there were nine physicians and only two athletic trainers and they weren't, we weren't doing as much. Now there are 13 athletic trainers with those nine physicians. So we're moving towards um, a direction where we're really being utilized for all of our skill set. That being said, um, there are counterparts, other uh, physician practices that don't even have athletic trainers yet. Um, they is largely because athletic trainers, uh, the orthopedic surgeons don't always know what we do and what we're capable of. Um, and that kind of makes our job duties very variable depending on where you're working. Um, you may be somewhere where you're just pretty much a medical history buff where you're taking that intake information that the app, that the patients are filling out and you're putting that into an electronic medical record so that it's documented and that's all you're doing very low patient interaction there is places where you are pretty much just brace fitting or cast fitting a friend of mine is working at AI DuPont Hospital, the Children's Hospital, and she is a specialized caster right now. She's casting, you know, for scoliosis. She's casting for fractures. Um, so she's utilizing her skill set in, in, in a way that, you know, you don't learn in your undergrad or graduate degree program, but you can kind of adapt your taping and bracing skills and move them into casting and learn on the job. There's also athletic trainers that are working just as, um, scribes where you're documenting whatever the physician is doing, whether it's the examination or the treatment, um, or you might just be working to get certification or prior approval for MRIs, other diagnostic tests, or even surgeries. Um, your daily setting might be a little different. Some people are working with a doctor all day, every day. That's what I do, and that's what I'll focus on today. Um, you might be helping a nurse practitioner, a phys physician assistant. You might be splitting time between a clinic seeing patients and a, phys a physical therapy office working as a PT aide, or maybe even doing high school schedule or things like that high school coverage um, and if you're really lucky like me you do also get some OR time and we'll go back into that and um, how I got to be there um, so my job my position I tell everyone I carry the team I'm doing everything from putting in medical information and um, prior medical diagnosis or surgical procedures or medications and um, into the patient's chart. And then I'm also examining the patient. I'm doing a lot of hands-on work. I'm the person doing the Lachman. I'm the person, um, you know, walking through range of motion, manual muscle tests. And then I come out of the room and I pull up any diagnostic studies that the patients have had, whether they be x-rays, MRIs, or CT scans. And I put together all of the information that I've received from the patient and from the medical paperwork. And I kind of give it all to the doctor in the most important way. Um, weed through the things that aren't necessarily necessary. You know, patients always want to talk that, oh, it's been cracking for this long, but is that really um, a clinical finding we need to worry about or can we move on from that? Um, and then the doctor and I are talking about, you know, what types of treatments might be good for this patient, um, what types of treatments they may have already tried and failed. And then we are going back into the room and we are 
you know, administering that treatment or starting that, that um, treatment plan as far as ordering physical therapy, maybe ordering MRIs, or setting them up for surgical intervention. Um, so I really do a, kind of a, a lot of everything. I do a little bit of casting, I do a little bit of suture remover, I'll do a little bit of bracing, um, but it's very much our domain two, our clinical evaluation and diagnosis is what I'm doing. Um, you have to have a strong evaluation skill set to do this. You have to know how to do all of your special tests. Um, you do have to rely on some of the general medical conditions that we do learn in our scope of practice, um, age appropriate medical conditions, you know, seeing patients with juvenile um, arthritis, we're seeing patients with osteoporosis or osteopenia, we're seeing patients with diabetes or cancer, and we have to know how those medical conditions may impact the musculoskeletal injury or problem that they're there for. We also deal a little bit with pharmacology as far as, um, you know, the uses of different medications, whether they're NSAIDs, whether they're narcotics, whether they're different types of um, rheumatological medications and things like that. And you have to understand drug interactions, drug allergies. If a patient is on um, blood thinners, you can't have NSAIDs. You really have to kind of pull out some of that some of that knowledge that we don't cover a whole lot, I feel like in our in our clinical education. I had two uh, pharmac pharmacology um, lectures in undergrad, and maybe in your your where you are, you're doing more. But that's something that we're using a lot. When we're on the job, we also get to learn a lot. Um, there's medical conditions out there that you just can't cover when you're in, in school. And there's medical conditions that you're going to see in the office that you've never even heard of before. You're also working hand in hand with a doctor, looking at x-rays, looking at MRIs, looking at CT scans, looking at lab work and blood work. And you get to learn how to do that. I can read an MRI for a shoulder and a knee better than I did six years ago when I first, and I thought I was good six years ago when I first started this job. Um, so that is something really cool when you're doing this. If you're interested in a position like this, opportunity is really all around you. We have, we are a clinical site for Newman University and we've had other clinical rotations with other universities. The caveat to that is you're working with um, patients who have insurance and it doesn't get to be as hands-on as you may want it to be. So if you're trying to learn your clinical set through your um, educational program, you might not be able to do as many Lachman tests or as many um, exams on patients because of the bureaucracy and where we are in this setting. Um, I do recommend if you were to be interested in a job like this and if you go for your um, interview that you request a day shadowing an athletic trainer who's already working there. Um, it's an area where, like I said previously, our job description is very variable and you don't want to get your stuff, yourself set into a position where you don't get to do what you were educated to do, where you don't get to use your skill set. Um, so that's something that I would consider if I were to be, be applying to another position or if I'm telling somebody who's applying to a similar position. You also have to understand what your state practice acts are. I know we talked about this in a couple of the other earlier presentations. Um, there is limitations to what you can and can't do. Um, there's also limitations to growing in this type of situation or environment. Uh, you might need to consider, if you do want to grow, getting something like an orthopedic tech certification. Uh, that is a similar certification to a CSCS or um, another line of certification where you have to put in a certain amount of hours. It's a thousand, so that's about six months of working in an orthopedic office of observation. And then you have to sit for an exam similar to a BOC exam. And once you have that certification, you have to have a certain amount of CEUs every um, year to continue your certification. The cool thing about orthopedic tech certification is it is recognized as a first assist in the hospital in the surgical operating room. So that's something I got two years ago. And that allows me to first assist in the ACL surgeries, in the rotator cuff repairs, and in some hip, knee, and um, shoulder uh, replacement surgeries. 
Um, another thing that some of my former coworkers and friends in this area have done is they've gotten a phlebotomy certification so that they can draw blood. This is particularly helpful if you're working with a physician who does PRP or stem cell. This might be something that you can do to bolster your resume. And then I have a friend who's a CPR instructor. Um, physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, and PAs, they all have to get their CPR certification every two years just like we do. So he's a CPR instructor. He does the entire practice practice every two years and he gets a little extra dough on the side for that so that's pretty great. Um, if this is something that you're interested in in pursuing you can do an athletic training fellowship program. Uh, the Stedman University or the Stedman Clinic out in Colorado is just an example of this. You go for a year you get put into all these different types of um, athletic training within physician practice settings, and you learn. You learn how to suture, you learn how to be an assistant in the OR, you learn how to cast, you learn how to do everything that you might need to do in a physician's office, and then you can kind of bolster yourself for that position. I did not do that myself. I've been learning on the job. Once I had my orthopedic tech certification, I learned to suture on patients with my doctor. So that was actually pretty cool. Um, there is the option for the Athletic Trainers in Physician Practice Society. Uh, this is a pretty new society within the last three years, but their website is really great for um, job opportunities as well as fellowship programs that you can do if you're interested in this type of position. Um, you can look that up. Off the record, there are certain pros and cons to this position. I don't know if you saw on my first page, it's a cool 70 degrees year round. You're not standing out in harsh weather. You're not on the sideline. You're not working all day. Most of the time, it's a nine to five schedule. Obviously, you're dependent on patients. And if you have a 415 patient that takes an hour in there, maybe you're getting out a little bit after five. But largely, it's a schedule that's you know consistent and that you can handle. Um, you do get the job, the opportunity, like I said earlier, to really expand your skill set and your knowledge base. You're learning about general medical conditions that maybe you didn't know of before or you didn't get an, a lot of information on during your schooling. You're also learning about x-rays, MRIs, proper you know, referral for surgery versus non-operative care. Um, those things are pretty cool. I work with nine different physicians, so I get nine different um, medical philosophies and I've worked with all of them in rotation and I get a lot of different ideas on how to treat some of the problems that you know I've been treating on my own as an athletic trainer I get a lot of uh, you know outside of the box thinking which is really nice um, there is an element of community education to this which is great when I walk into an exam room to see a patient, I immediately introduce myself as the athletic trainer working with whatever doctor I'm working with. And you're seeing patients that aren't used to an athletic trainer that don't know what an athletic trainer can do. So I get to educate them. Um, you know, I get the joke probably five times a day. Oh, you're going to put me back out on the field. Am I going to pitch for the Phillies this season? And it's a great opportunity for me to, you know, educate people on what it is that we do, what it is we can offer them and what our schooling is. Um, I do also get the times where people say, oh, so you're still in school. You're going to be a doctor. And I have to just educate a little bit more and give them information. Um, I also can work with them about preventing some of their future injuries, you know, in that time where I'm in the room with them. So it's a good tool for um, expanding the knowledge in the public of what athletic, who athletic trainers are and what we can do. Obviously, cool thing is you can take a vacation whenever you want. Um, there's vacation days, you can plan a wedding during what would normally be your women's basketball season. Um, it's really nice in that regard. A pro and con is that you never know what you're going to get behind that exam room door. You knock on the door, you have a patient's name and date of birth in your hand, and you have relatively nothing else. Um, so you can walk in and you can see somebody who is 88 years old and they fell out of a bed in a nursing home and nobody knows when it actually happened. You can go in and you can see an eight year old that fell off the monkey bars. You can go in and you can see a 34 year old that was doing box jumps. Um, you never know what you're gonna get when you work in there and it keeps you on your toes. That being said, you never know when you're gonna walk in and you know, you're seeing somebody who had a fracture for a gunshot wound or somebody who had um, 
a loss and a motor vehicle accident that resulted in a loss in their family. Um, so you really have to be prepared to be unprepared for whatever you're walking into. Um, and it keeps you on your toes. So I do like that. Um, sometimes in this position, there's not a whole lot of room to grow. I know we talked earlier about practice administration. When you think about my office, um, I came in with a practice administrator, with a um, clinical manager. Um, those positions have been filled for a long time with our 13 athletic trainers. We are all on the same base. There's no hierarchy. Um, I have been able to do things to, you know, make myself more marketable and grow in my job. Um, but there's not a lot of coming up into the world where um, in my last job there was, you know, you were an assistant athletic trainer, you could, you could strive to be a head athletic trainer and things like that. Um, being the person that carries the team can somewhat be daunting. I am doing all of the documentation for every patient that comes in. The doctor is reading through my documentation and signing off on it, but I'm have, I have to write everything that we said. And so two areas that really are, kind of limiting or, or that we want to think about in that is getting insurance insurance approval. It is harder every day to get approval for different things. You have to really document everything that has tried and failed for that patient in order to get approval to move forward with your next line of treatment. You can't just get an MRI at the drop of a hat. Um, the other problem is, you know, the lawyer aspect of it, the legal aspect of it. If a patient does something that you told them specifically not to do, they might, you know, that, that what you've documented might end up being brought up in a court of law, or if a patient was in a motor vehicle accident or a workman's comp accident, what you're documenting is going to be held accountable down the line should something go wrong. So you have to make sure that you're really good at that aspect. Another problem or potential con would be that at the end of the day, this is a business. You're seeing patients instead of athletes. They're paying a copay. Their insurance is paying for the services that are being rendered. And a lot of the times, you know, they, they want what they want and whether or not it's medically necessary, you have to remember that, whether it's um, something the doctor is willing for, to provide or, or um, it can get a little dicey in the patient feeling like they're not getting what they want out of the practice. And at the end of the line, you need patients to, you know, bring in revenue to keep your practice afloat. Um, so you have to find that happy medium where, you know, it's not, you get whatever you want. It's you get what is medically necessary and what is needed for you. And you're keeping your patients satisfied and making sure that they're getting the best medical care that they can have. And they're happy with the medical care that they're given. Um, overall, I love what I'm doing. Uh, it's taught me a lot. And the I never thought I would be in the OR operating on anyone when I was an undergrad. So that has been a very cool new experience and it keeps you on your toes. So I really appreciate it. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be on the panel at the end and I will be um, able to answer them. Excellent, Shannon. Thank you so much. So we'll get to some other que some questions uh, when we get to the panel. I, uh, we have one more person left. Last but certainly not least, Bridget. Bridget Whitemore. She is up next. She's going to be talking about uh, performing, performing arts. So Bridget attended Westchester University of Pennsylvania, earned a bachelor's degree in athletic training with a double minor in theater and dance. Uh, she started the athletic training program at a high school in North Philadelphia, where she worked for about six and a half years. And during this time, she completed a master's of performing arts medicine from Shenandoah University. And she's now working as a grad assistant, graduate teaching assistant at Moravian College with the goal of working, uh, continuing her work with performing artists while earning her Doctor of Athletic Training. So Bridget, go ahead and take it away. Great, thank you. Let's get this somewhere out of the way here. All right. All right. Thank you, Jason. Um, so like Jason said, I started, I just started a graduate teaching position at Moravian College. Uh, and I also will be working um, with the health center in the fall. And I'm hoping to pull in some performing artists there, dancers and musicians um, specifically for orthopedic evaluations, um, as well as like rehabilitation and treatment. Um, so I've worked with dancers in the past at Shenandoah University when I earned my performing arts medicine master's certificate. 
Um, and I've also worked or completed a um, internship at University of North Carolina School of the Arts when I was earning my bachelor's degree, um, where I primarily worked with dancers. So, here. Performing arts medicine um, is a very broad term. So as I said before, I've worked with dancers and musicians, but performing arts medicine can also include um, circus arts, theater arts, and ice skating. And depending on where you are working and who is hiring you and what performing art population that you are working with will really kind of determine your goals and your responsibilities um, that you have on a regular basis. So every setting is different. So at Shenandoah University, um, I would help treat, rehabilitate, and evaluate dancers and musicians in the athletic training room. And they also provide backstage coverage during shows and during dress rehearsals. Um, so this coverage would include short treatments uh, that the, um, particularly the dancers in this case would need and also evaluations that they would need um, as well. So the, um, during dress rehearsals, is a pretty stressful, stressful time for, for anyone in the collegiate setting um, because the performances usually happen at the end of a semester and the students that are on this webinar now know that that's a very stressful time. It's very fatiguing. You're already exhausted. You're trying to cram for your finals and then you're going to add dress rehearsals that are six hours, four hours a day on late at night for an entire week prior to your actual show. So this is a time where um, dancers or anyone within the theater arts within the collegiate setting um, get injured and it's a, it's a higher, has a higher injury rate um, in that setting. At Shenandoah University, they also work to um, develop and implement emergency action plans for all of the performing arts settings. Um, and they also do pre-screening and functional assessments there too. So similar to that setting uh, is where I had my internship at University of North Carolina School of the Arts, but they saw a broader range of performing artists, like dancers and musicians, theater artists, but also students that were involved in filmmaking, design, and production. Uh, another example, or other examples, I guess we could say Cirque du Soleil and Neurosport also hire athletic trainers. So Cirque du Soleil is obviously for the circus, as seen in the picture on this slide. Um, and then Neurosport hires athletic trainers for Broadway shows. So for both of these um, settings, the athletic trainers uh, could be assigned to a specific show, and that show could be just a, a permanent placement as to where um, a permanent placement as where the show is being performed. Or the athletic trainer could have a choice to tour with a group of performers and the production crew as they tour the nation and put on performances. Or this could also include something that's internationally as well. So I think the great thing about performing arts is it not only um, allows you to work nationally across the United States, but it would uh, allow you to work internationally as well if that's something that you are interested in um, because you are hypothetically being hired through the United States and then that since they are there you're in your employer you can um, work internationally on a green card. Um, one last example is like Disneyland or um, Disney World also hires athletic trainers. Um, so their role is a little different. They are hired through a physical therapy clinic uh, and this is governed by OSHA, which is which um, Kelly was discussing earlier in this webinar. So because they're governed through OSHA, this position is all prevention based and uh, athletic trainers cannot directly rehabilitate um, a specific injury, but they can work with performers regarding um, their ability to help improve aspects of their performance um, they give a lot of wellness and prevention based seminars and workshops for the performers. Um, and something that's neat too, as uh, for the Disneyland um, and Disney World positions, is they also hire uh, athletic trainers for the production crew and the production sets. So, pretty much anyone who works um, on the production sets or with the actors or with the performers at Disneyland or Disney World, you know, they could also be treated by the athletic trainers um, 
the same thing with that prevention base in mind. So, I mean, this could be anyone, and this could also be anyone you're traveling with, with theater or with dance. You know, you could, you could hypothetically treat the production manager, the director, the stagehands, the riggers, the carpenters, um, anyone alike within that production setting is um, definitely a possibility of treatment depending upon where or who you are employed by and how they kind of govern that. Uh, so just like I was saying, the setting that you're working in could be completely, could be different across the populations and your daily roles and responsibilities could be different. Your basic knowledge that you need to know will also be different depending on the setting that you're working with and the types of performers that you're working with. So just on the slide here with a demonstration, um, basic knowledge of intrinsic versus extrinsic factors. So we see intrinsic and extrinsic factors all the time in our traditional sports settings, but some that are um, specific to performing artists for extrinsic factors, um, like aesthetic demands. Um, this is something that you don't see in the traditional sport setting, but in performing artists, especially with ice skaters, um, people involved in theater, circus arts, uh, dancers, they are very heavily focused on a long, lean, thin, body. And with that brings um, a lot of issues. But one of those issues is certainly training issues because these individuals are going to be more influenced to create training errors um, by overcompensating, um, trying to turn out more, and then eventually down the line having um, like a hip labral tear. So there are definitely factors um, with aesthetics that we can't necessarily control as athletic trainers. We can do our best with education and trying to change the culture of performing arts, but I think that that's always going to be a, a slight factor that's going to be in performing artists, um, especially in the extremely traditional performing arts setting. Other extrinsic, extrinsic examples are in, uh, environmental conditions. So just but going back to Disneyland, Disney World, these performers are outside in the hot and humid weather all the time, and they're wearing extremely heavy and hot and non-breathable costumes. Like there's, you know, the, the beast from Beauty and the Beast or someone as Cinderella or someone as Belle, they have multiple layers on at one time. They can't take many breaks. Um, and as I said, they are outside for most of the day, every day um, as part of their job. So it's definitely something that athletic trainers do to create these prevention protocols to make sure that these um, performers are safe while they are operating uh, and performing in these heavy uniforms. Uh, well, not uniforms, but costumes. Um, another thing that uh, could be considered for environmental conditions are musicians. Um, so oftentimes, especially in the summer months, musicians um, perform outside and hold concerts outside. And this not only affects their instrument, um, but could also impact them as well. And when they're sitting up there for a few hours at a time and they can't necessarily move at all, um, you have to work around that and figure out the best ways to um, prevent any issues or injuries or heat and illness that could result in that. Um, and then a last extrinsic factor example would be um, like shoes. So shoes, oftentimes with um, dancers, we know that they have their point shoes, um, or at least with the ballet dancers, they have their point shoes, which brings them over a smaller base of support. Um, but then oftentimes with a lot of dance, uh, they're, they're not wearing any shoes at all. Um, and then also with costumes, you have no idea what shoes you can wear and you also don't have, um, you don't have a choice of the shoe that you can wear that works best with your foot type, that works best with your, with your body type, provides the best support. So those are also things that you have to work around as an athletic trainer um, for extrinsic factors. Intrinsic factors um, are more uh, similar to kind of what we see in the traditional setting, but as far as uh, dance, I'd say that the pressure to be thin is definitely an intrinsic factor as well, so it's just a psychological factor. Um, they have very erratic schedules, and dancers and ice skaters and circus arts especially um, have more mobility and more flexibility because that's certainly how they get um, their parts when they try out. So. Uh, other, so understanding of physical demands and general culture, it's very different compared to the traditional sports setting, um, just because of that very aesthetic based culture. 
Uh, so understanding that and being aware of that and then kind of how, how, how you're going to work around that to make sure that the performer is safe um, is certainly a job that the athletic trainer takes on in the performing arts. Preventative taping unique to specific needs and aesthetics. Um, this could be a taping that is the color of that, uh, that performer's skin so that it doesn't show on stage or doesn't show during a performance or the taping has to be underneath the costume, has to work with the costume. Um, so all those things are something that you want to consider um, and it's something that you can easily apply as an athletic trainer now with the taping skills that you have now, you just need to kind of be more creative and work outside the box as to what you're going to do to help them um, to, instead of doing just like a traditional angle taping. Um, and then as far as proficiency and identifying occupational and ergonomic factors. Um, so, I mean, this can range from uh, several things, but um, so for musicians, for instance, um, a lot of their um, instruments are not necessarily ergonomically sound. So um, in order to help with that, if they are having issues with that, um, there are several little things that you can put on the instrument itself in order to actually improve their finger placement or to work better with someone who has smaller or shorter hands or a smaller palm that can't get around the instrument the, the way that they need to. Um, if, the, if the performing artist is um, or is interested in that. And then another example um, would just be the theater setting in general. So as I stated before with the production crews, um, so with production crews, it brings different sets, different props, curtain weights that are around, um, different lights and whatnot. And all of those things can be on the floor, on the ground, not organized, and it can cause a risk for injury. So setting up um, preventative measures and just rules and regulations at the specific um, location that you are working at is also something that the athletic trainer is going to do. So I kind of went over a little bit about the emergency action plan, um, which would just be, as I said, very specific to all of the performing arts settings uh, that the performers are performing in or that they are rehearsing in. So like in a collegiate setting, you also want to consider the classrooms that they are rehearsing in um, as well. And then as far as pre-screening and functional assessments, this is mixed in the performing arts setting. If there's an athletic trainer that works with the performing arts, they're absolutely doing pre-screening and functional assessments. Um, some performing arts have physical therapists that are doing pre-screening and functional assessments. It kind of all depends, and some don't have anything going on right now. Um, but for pre-screening, it's fairly general to what you'll see in a traditional sports setting. Um, but I'd also say that what changes or what you want to look out for or what, what's different from that is is the range of motion that you're seeing so these individuals most of these individuals are going to be at that end range of motion that you'll see in most of your sports population or significantly beyond that and they actually need that range of motion in order to succeed in a higher level elite status for a performer so like a um, ballet dancer for instance when she goes into releve which is basically just moving into um doing like a heel raise and now you're up on like the bottoms of your feet a dancer would need 70 to 90 degrees of dorsiflexion in that first metatarsophalangeal joint in order to actually achieve that position that releve position and that is the most basic position that a dancer could achieve and would need for anything else so if they don't have that 70 to 90 degrees um, then they will not be successful in uh, dancing as well and we know that um, for most of our range of motion for those that did not dance, no one really has that 70 to 90 degrees. So that's a lot of range just in that small joint uh, expected alone. Um, and then as far as functional assessments for um, part of the pre-screening, for dancers, you can do functional assessments um, just to see how they're working biomechanically and make sure that's functioning properly. For musician, you can have them come in with their instrument and you'll see to make sure that they're sitting with proper posture and proper um, instrument posture and that they are doing everything they possibly can can in order to prevent injuries from happening just from being in one position for multiple hours at a time. Um, as far as rehabilitation, I went over some of those listed there and some of the examples, but just part of the instruct inappropriate care and postural control exercises. So this is just one thing I wanted to emphasize with performing arts is, is very repetitive. So 
yes, performers are taking classes that may be different from um, the technique that they're used to, or they could be also cross conditioning, hopefully. Um, but one thing that they are, um, one thing that they are doing all the time is rehearsing and they're rehearsing for shows and those shows have specific choreography or specific music that they're rehearsing over and over and over again so it's on the same side stressing the same side over and over again creating those repetitive overuse injuries which is definitely something you're going to see way more in this population than you'll see in um, several other traditional populations. But I think, I mean, for me personally, I love that. And I love thinking about the, um, how this occurred and how they got here um, by kind of working backwards during their you know, medical history. And, um, and then just being like very creative of, of working outside the box and figuring out what you can do to help them um, alleviate this and obviously prevent it in the future. And um, manual therapy is a huge thing that performing artists also love as well. Rehabilitation. So as far as um, experience recommendations, um, um, there are several things that you could do. Uh, one of those things is just pursuing an internship. So as I said, mine was at University of North Carolina School of the Arts. It's over the summer. They do it every year. Um, to my knowledge, I still believe it's five weeks, but that could be incorrect. Um, so applying to that early. And uh, if, if you are interested, that's a great, it's a great internship um, to get some experience, as I said, with a broader range of um, of performing artists. Other ways that you could get experience is to observe other athletic trainers or other healthcare professionals in the performing arts setting. So in Pennsylvania, uh, and this is not the only performing arts settings in Pennsylvania, but I know at Lehigh Valley Performing Arts uh, in, in Bethlehem or Pennsylvania, this is uh, very close to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, they um, employ an athletic trainer and she works with high school athletes or high school, um, I apologize, high school performers as well, but a whole broad range of performers at that school. At um, Pittsburgh, in Pittsburgh, um, they work with, athletic trainers work with the Pittsburgh Ballet. Um, anywhere else in Pennsylvania that I'm thinking of. Regardless of that, there's also um, chances to observe, let's say like Houston Ballet hires athletic trainers. Several um, dance companies and collegiate programs are starting to hire athletic trainers, uh, especially for like their dance programs or their musicians. Um, so really like reaching out to those individuals and observing them to get like a more hands-on and or face-to-face -face approach to really immerse yourself in that setting and see if that's something you like, I would absolutely recommend. But it's also an amazing way and excuse to network because you get to meet those individuals, you get to, um, you know, they get to know who you are. And then if a job happens down the line at that setting, or if they know of a job that happens somewhere else, they may re reach out to you because they thought about you because you were someone who who observed and who they met and who they know. Um, and that is a lot of what the performing arts medicine is working off of right now is just really like networking is key because there are not a lot of jobs that post performing arts medicine um, for athletic training, um, for athletic trainers on job sites. And you really do need to know people in order to find out about the uh, smaller jobs um, as opposed to just finding out about Cirque, Cirque du Soleil because they actually do post on the National Athletic Trainers uh, website and other websites as well. Um, other experience recommendations, as everyone else has said, just like joining state, district, national, and international committees, which I'll get to on my next slide, and then reaching out to, um, you know, NATA or reaching out to the Committee on Practice Advancement um, to ask for some suggestions or, you know, where you could also look um, as well for more experience. Um, as far as credential suggestions, as I said, these are just um, these are just suggestions. So they're not something that you have to take to heart and you have to earn these things in order to actually work with performing artists. But these are something, or at least looking into these programs, I've found that um, they would certainly help, especially if you don't have a performing arts background um, and you didn't grow up in the performing arts and whatnot. So one of those things, um, one of the things you'll see out there a lot if you start looking into this is dance science. Um, that's, 
there are a lot of there are a few programs in the United States for dance science. There are a lot of a pro, lot of programs uh, based in dance science in the UK as well. One in the US is through um, Indiana University, and that's you would be earning like a master's of kinesiology, and you'd be getting a clinical assistantship in dance. So you'd be working with their dancers while earning that master's of kinesiology. Um, performing arts medicine is even more rare. Um, in the United States. So the only program that I know of right now that is doing this is um, Shenandoah University, which is where I got my performing arts medicine master's certificate. And the other program that I know of um, that focuses on this specifically is at the University College of London, um, where you get a postgraduate diploma in performing arts medicine. I also put nutrition on here as well, so a certified sports nutritionist through the uh, International Society of Sports Nutrition. And I did that because, as I said earlier, aesthetics is a huge thing in within lots of performing arts settings, and you will be confronted with individuals that have behavioral eating disorders and uh, just eating disorders in general um, who develop very bad habits because of all of these demands that are placed on them especially if those demands are happening at a younger age um, and it's it's um very highly prevalent within ballet specifically because that is definitely the uh technique that promotes the most thin uh, and long lines. And that's also the technique that starts early, uh, early performance specialization very young, where those dancers that are you know, very promising, they're dancing at pre-professional schools that basically filter into the dance companies themselves. So having a certified uh, sports nutritionist background is something that would certainly help. Um, help you provide you more education on how to guide these performers and um, make sure that they're safe and educate them and, and start to create some change in that setting. And the last thing I recommended was safety um, through just through like OSHA in general, the Occupational uh, Safety and Health Administration, because especially as I was saying before, with theater or anywhere that you're going to have a production crew, uh, you are going to be faced um, with injuries uh, on the production side of things and that a lot of theaters and a lot of these settings don't have a lot of rules and regulations in place. Um, and I think OSHA would be something that would absolutely help uh, with that. And one, like one article that I read the other day, like theater, which was a theater survey, um, they surveyed both performers and production workers among three different professional like theater companies, and basically what for for concussions. And basically what they found was that the production crew actually had a higher rate of concussions than the performers themselves because of all the head impacts they were getting from the um, from the set and the scenery and the carpentry that they were working on. Um, and they're not doing anything to prevent that. They're not wearing like hard hats or anything along those lines. So um, getting a better background, especially with OSHA and how they kind of govern these things will certainly help you put plans in place that'll help prevent those concussions from happening in the future. And then lastly is just the professional organizations. So these are not the only organizations that are out there, um, but these are ones that I'm certainly involved with myself. Uh, so the one is through the National Athletic Trainers Association and it's the Performing Arts Emerging, um, Emerging Settings Group. So you can easily find that on the NATA's website. Um, and it just explains a little more what I explained today, it explains other things and other settings that um, athletic trainers are working in for performing artists. So that's something that if you're interested in this setting, you should absolutely, um, absolutely look at that. And then those and then those that are involved in that committee are also great resources. They're extremely knowledgeable. They're extremely friendly. They work all over the US. So it's really good to get to know them as well. Uh, another setting is or another, excuse me, a professional organization to potentially get involved in is the Performing Arts Medicine Association, which is PAMA. This association primarily focuses on musicians, but uh, musicians and vocalists, but there's also a sprinkling of uh, dance in there as well. And then the last one on here is IATOMS, which is the International Association for Dance Medicine and Science. So as this one implies, it focuses primarily on dancers. But what's really neat about this um, 
association is that it's international. So uh, I just finally just joined this like a year and a half or so ago and went to my first IADAMS conference this past October. And I've met so many people within the performing arts setting. And these are people that are not just in the US, but all over the world. So it's really neat to kind of, uh, you know, know who these people are. And now they know who I am. And then these network opp networking opportunities are happening. So that's another one if you're interested in dance specifically that I would absolutely recommend um, joining and getting involved with. And they also have a student organization too. So thank you everyone for taking time and listening to my presentation. Um, my Moravian email is listed there. If you have any more questions, obviously you're welcome to jot that down. But as Jason has been saying, we will be doing that question and answer at the end. Very good, Bridget. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're uh, so. With that be you know, with that being said, let's uh, let me, let's try and bring all of our speakers up here. Anybody that can stay with us, I realize time wise has kind of gotten away from us a little bit, but that's okay. Um, so anybody that can kind of stick around, we have a couple of unanswered questions here directed to a few people uh, specifically, but uh, then we can kind of uh, go through some of the, them, and I uh, have a couple of other qu questions that have kind of popped up uh, in my own my own head here too that we can try and just get a little more information with uh, with the great in addition to the great information you guys have all presented today so I really really appreciate it um, one was so Shannon this came in kind of after you were you were done here so this is so how would you recommend going about marketing yourself to those physicians that you would like to work with but don't fully understand what ATs do in the case, in the case where you don't even, where they don't even offer an AT a job because they are not sure what they do. Yeah. Um, so I think the best way to do that. And as I said, you know, at the end of the day, being in a physician's office, it is a business and it's about generating revenue. So it's looking at ways to um, increase patient volume is the best um, kind of selling point. Um, I can evaluate a patient and I can also, after the doctor has been seen with the patient, I can kind of do a circle back, follow up education, answer any questions that the patient has remaining. And that allows the doctor to get out of the patient's room and move into the next patient's room. Um, so that kind of time, the before and after time is where I think we are most market marketable because we can help um, condense down the time that the doctor actually has to spend in the room with the patient. Um, the physician I work with, we've been together for six years. We have a lot of uh, returning patients. He really rarely lays a hand on the patient. He'll go into the room and he'll say, Shannon tells me you tore your ACL. And the patients that we have that, especially the repeating patients, they know that, you know, I gave a thorough evaluation and the doctor knows all of the information and that's going to help get the doctor into the next room, help increase the patients that we see in a day. And um, that's kind of probably your best bet as far as pitching yourself to a provider, an orthopedic provider to get into this type of position. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see what else we got here. All right. Um, so I want you to, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to kind of do a little stretch here for a second. So a student listening has been totally sold on each of your settings. And they want to know what, what's the one skill that they should work on right now. What would that be? None of you will ever want to be on a job interview with me at all. I think one of um, the biggest things while you're in undergrad right now is getting confidence in yourself. Um, and that's regardless of what um, place you go into, what job you um, setting you have. If you're in a traditional setting, you're going to deal with coaches and parents and athletes that are hard to deal with. If you're in a physician's office, you're going to deal with doctors. You know, I, my physicians, most of them have been doctors longer than I've been alive. So knowing how to present yourself in a confident manner and answer the questions and, and be sure of your skill set and your knowledge base. And that's something you have to take the time while you're in school, I think, to, to learn and to grasp and then when you're out in the world, like don't be afraid to make mistakes, but also don't be afraid to, you know, stand by yourself and your skill set and um, put your confidence out there. 
Anybody else? I'll jump in. Sure. Um, I would have to say for for you know for the occupational um, setting, um, one of the uh, a skill that you can work on would probably be adaptability. Um, so I'm in a field where um, we deal with a lot of construction and utility companies, um, and if it's not changing, it's not then it's not a typical day. So being open, um, being adaptable, being willing to um, make those changes, learn the changes, um, kind of open-mindedness, it helps with the, um, your overall, you know, thinking outside the box. So I'd have to say that's probably the, the skill set that um, I um, uh, admire most out of, uh, out of our employees is that they are very, very, very adaptable. I think for me, networking, um, a lot of times, the only way that you're going to enter one of these positions or create one of these positions is by networking. So understanding the right people, um, doing your research with who you should be approaching at conferences or emailing or anything like that can be very helpful. So I would agree, obviously, I would agree with Stephanie as well, and I think networking has made a huge difference for me. Um, and it also gives you the opportunity to kind of learn how those um, individuals that you are networking with run or are involved with the performing arts and how they do it, since performing arts is still very uh, new and not as structured as other settings. Um, so it helps you to form like the best uh, possibility for your performers um, when you are maybe looking to create a program as well. But then I'd also say um, overuse injuries. So I think that at least with my program, we focused a lot on acute injuries. Uh, and then when I got out of school, I realized that I've, at least with performing artists, that overuse injuries are huge. And it happens at least 60% or more of the time for performing artists that are going to come into your athletic training and are going to have an overuse injury. So kind of being aware of, of those, um, I think will be good and just starting to practice those skills as much as you possibly can at your clinical rotations now. I can chime in on that one too. I think um, understanding that change is going to be constant and embrace change and know that change is the norm, I think, at this point in time. And then don't be afraid to take an Excel class and learn how to run reports and interpret <laughs> reports and create good looking reports. Very good. Very good. The um so this is, the, this is the last question I have for the group and we'll see if anybody else has any more or if you have questions for each other, that's totally fine too. But we're talking reports. This is the COPA committee. Um, and you know, Kelly had a lot of good you know, data analytics stuff, but like how in your particular settings, what's, what are some of the things that you do to show your value or show your worth? Just like maybe a metric or, or two or, or something like that. Um, well, I can answer that. Um, so for us, we have KPIs that we have to meet, showing that we meet all the criteria for whatever programs we've initiated. Um, did we reach the target, um, target market? Did we um, complete them timely? What were the outcomes? If we had any um, uh, difficulties me meeting that, um, the goal or the KPI, what were our mitigation strategies? So those we have to produce um, bi-weekly and then monthly and then annually. Cool. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, anybody else? I know for me, because I had just created the position and it was fairly new, um, it was more so just tracking our injuries on such something easy, such as an Excel sheet, um, and then kind of meeting either weekly or monthly, whatever is convenient for our chief of police or chief of fire of what are our com common injuries and what are we doing um, to improve those, which were mainly our mobility clinics and things like that, and then tracking it over time. So in our six month period, we were able to say, these were how many injuries we had. These are how many injuries we've had, you know, in the last month compared to the beginning. Um, and these, this is what we foresee in the future. And then again, just 
also tracking the numbers of how much money we were able to serve in workman's comp and things like that. Very good, thank you. And um, not to harp on the business aspect of it, but um, in my specific setting, one of the key things that I think has made me um, more marketable within my, pr my practice is our Google reviews and our, um, you know, our patient reviews. Every time a patient leaves our office, they get a text message asking to, you know, review their appointment that day. And my name, every time my name is in a review, it gets pulled into a system and I, and I can, I have access to them. And then you can also see them on Google or on Yelp or whatever. And it's something, you know, if, if a patient puts in there and that, that athletic trainer was really great or that, that Shannon was really, she was knowledgeable and very considerate, you know, patients, the more you interact with them, they do, um, they do appreciate that stuff. And then they're not afraid in this day and age, nobody's afraid to put their voice out there and their opinions. Um, so every time that happens, that kind of goes into a little pocket for me specifically to help myself when I'm going back to my performance evaluation and things like that. Because when you get into work, working and, and stuff, those are almost, you know, those patient references, those customer references yeah. are something that can help build you in that specific, you know, place or area of work. Very good. Yelp. I never, I, I, I never thought about that. That's a great point. Yeah, you can, you can put a lot out there for your orthopedic <laughs> provider. All right. Well, I don't have any other questions in the Q and A. So if there are no other questions, I think we can, we can call this, uh, call this good. So thank you everybody so much. You, all did wonderful presentations. Anybody, any of the attendees, again, feel free to contact people at their, their uh, contact information, um, email their questions to us, and we will, we can at least send them off to uh, those, those other folks that get their, um, you know, get some answers for you. Uh, Dr. Sefton, who couldn't st stick around on us, um, was, is completely fine with uh, fielding any of the questions that might get sent to her, as well as I'm sure just about everybody else would, uh, be the same way. So if, uh, if there are no other questions, then have a good night. And thank you, everybody. Thank you to all the presenters, everybody that helped this, uh, help pull this little webinar off. We really, really appreciate it. And we hope you got uh, a lot of good from it. So take care, everybody. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Have a good night. You too.